of 22 Minutes of Unconditional Love, just out in paperback by Daphne Merkin. Um, we are lucky enough to have some signed book plates. So this is the promotional part of the uh, program. If you uh, contact us and, and call us right away, you will be uh, one of a few lucky members to receive a signed book plate signed by Daphne Merkin in your new copy of the paperback edition of this amazing book, 22 Minutes of Unconditional Love, uh, praised by Adrian Broder in the New York Times Book Review, describes it as an arresting novel that explores the alchemy of contradictions that exist in all great works of literature. Observant and witty, Merkin makes each sentence pack a provocative wallop. So come for the surprise of a compulsively readable novel. Obsession makes for good copy, the narrator tells us, and stay for a fascinating lesson on the making of art. Daphne Merkin's previous uh, publications include a collection of essays called Fame Lunches on wooden icons, money, sex, the Brontes, and the importance of handbags. A previous novel, Enchantment, a memoir, This Close to Happy, and an essay collection, Dreaming of Hitler. And this evening, Daphne is joined by longtime friend and colleague, the esteemed Charles Chip McGrath, author of The Life and Times of Alfred Knopf, former deputy editor at The New Yorker magazine, former editor of The New York Times Book Review, and currently a contributing writer with The New York Times. So we are delighted to welcome you. Uh, we're looking forward to your conversation together about art, literature, writing, teaching, um, and wherever that takes us. And toward the end of our program, we'll have time for um, some brief questions. Uh, as folks are thinking of some questions, we welcome you to write them in the chat. And uh, so we'll give a very warm uh, Zoom welcome now to our two guests, Daphne Merkin and Chip McGrath. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank, thank you. So, I'm so sorry, Chip. Can I ask you one thing revealing once again the Luddite in me? How do I make I see everyone in little boxes. How do I yeah. make Chip bigger? Because I can barely, you know, how do I just make his box bigger? Right, okay. We, we want to go to in his video. Um, Catherine, can you walk uh, yeah. Daphne, that? It's called speaker view that you want to hit. If you see that um, on your screen, maybe the top right says view. Okay, so bring your cursor there. Yeah. And click on it and it gives you a choice of speaker, speaker. view or gallery. Right. So speaker. But I'm getting you. That's because I'm talking. As soon as I shut up, then you'll see whoever's speaking, you'll see big. Okay, great. All right. We I'm being quiet now. Yeah, okay. we don't have the ability to show both of you only on the screen. So back, you'll be back and forth. Okay, great. Okay, so can I, so I can start now? Can you see me? Yes, I can right. see. So, okay. So I think we should start by talking about your novel, which is fascinating. And, and we'll get to this and also very long in the making. And so for a start, Daphne, why don't you tell us if you can, or summarize, what, what is this novel about? Um, it's about, a woman in her late 20s, just turning 30, not terrifically experienced in the ways of romance and sex, who is fairly ambitious in her work life, is in book publishing, um, and Falls, well, the propulsive event to her kind of falling for the fatally wrong man is her psychiatrist, therapist dies. She feels bereft and meets a man, a lawyer at a book party, not a book party, at a party 
various spells ring that he is not the right man. And yet she is libidin libidinally, viscerally, very attracted to him. These bells continue to ring, but very shortly they're involved. He's sexually much more experienced than she is and sort of guides her into paths, I guess you'd say that she hasn't taken, been on. Um, pays her the kind of fixated, but essentially deprecating attention that a certain kind of man in these kind of destructive, but obsessive relationships pays. She eventually finds herself descending into a complete, fairly self-destructive, if not fairly, very self-destructive relationship with him that she doesn't know how to get out of. It kind of obscures a lot of other things in her life, although she does continue functioning as a book editor and Essentially, the novel covers the relationship. It's told in flashback from the, a period of about 10 years later, at which point the um, protagonist, Judith Stone, has married another man and is pregnant with her second child and presumably, emphasis on presumably, over the obsession. So the, the, the point should be emphasized is so that the, this character is kind of looking back and recollecting this experience and, and still trying to come to terms with it. What's interesting, not the least interesting about the book is that it has, it has and we'll get to this later, but it has a couple of voices. There's, right. the, voice, there's the voice of the narrator the person telling the story, though at a certain point she switches over and tells the story as if it was the third person. And then there's another character we'll get to, I, I'm gonna call the author. Who, and, but to me, what's interesting about all these vo uh, characters is the voice. I mean, you're we're well known as a very stylish writer, but this novel has a voice. It has a couple of voices, and which is what I think novels have to have. And I wonder if you would mind reading a bit of it in your own voice so that we could hear the voice of your character. Would that be okay? Sure, thank you, I will. I'm gonna read just two tiny sections. One is, uh, this is actually from a galley. I hope it's the same, um, it's, I, I think I changed this later, but here it's called the prologue and it's actually not the prologue later on, it's in italics. And then I'm just gonna read the last scene, which is short as this is. Um, so here goes. In this story, there is no final scene, no decisive change of heart, or firm resolve on my part, so much as a furious inner struggle, a struggle that has left no discernible traces, yet has marked me as surely as bruises after a fall. Because there is no end to the hunger for unconditional love and no end to my belief that he was the one to give it to me. I have no stopwatch to measure how long the experience of se sexual pleasure lasts at any particular time. It could be 10 minutes or 15 or 22. How do you measure the crest of a wave? All I know is that when it vanishes, it leaves in its wake a devouring appetite for more. To this day, I can't forget how he was always touching me in bed, acting as though my skin came as a surprise. You feel so soft, he said, so smooth. Nothing very original in that, I realize, and yet coming from him, I felt it as a lovely succumbing, a weakening of his ordinary resistance. 
Then there is this, I am a writer, a believer in the trans transcendent powers of art to shape experience so that others might recognize something of themselves in it. Except when it comes to my own life, it appears. I have decided to tell this story now after all these years as a, as a way of forcing it to the finish line. I am still confused about how I got to that place to begin with and how I got out without going mad, howling like a wolf. I think it had something to do, despite all the evidence to the contrary, with some intact shred of a life force. I willed him out of my life in order to pursue a more sane existence, one that would include a husband and children, a daughter I would bring up to feel full in herself without vast absences or ravaging needs. But it was just that, an effort of will rather than a natural ending, only a sense that if I wanted to survive, I would have to move on. Meanwhile, the efficient little clock on my desk keeps marking the passage of time. If you pick up this clock, a practically weightless black brawn traveling clock with white hour and minute hands and a yellow second hand, and hold it close to your ear, you can hear a faint even tick. So many days, months, and years have intervened, not to mention a marriage, the daughter I wished for, and another child on the way, you'd think he'd have no place in my thoughts anymore. And for periods of time, he doesn't, only to alight on my nerve endings once again. It has to do, I imagine, with the tedium the worn routines that are an inescapable part of domestic life, some habit of my husband's that I have tired of, such as the way he blinks his eyes rapidly when someone disagrees with him, or the way my daughter puts up an argument about something perfectly reasonable, like getting into her pajamas. Suddenly a space opens up, a wedge of restlessness mixed with longing, and Howard Rose, walks back in and this is the very end of the book um second a week or so ago i tried calling him again it was right after the 11 o'clock news and something something from way back that flickered for a minute up there on the TV screen in the set of a man's jaw reminded me of Howard Rose. Oh, I should just interrupt and say, this is not set in contemporary moment. It's set back in the eighties, even the current, sorry. I let the phone ring three, four, 20 times. I counted them. 20. No voicemail, no answering machine, no display of that eagerness not to miss a message that I and everyone I knew exhibited. I hung on with the receiver getting sweaty in my hand, willing him back, all the way back inside me again. But he was out, or more likely he was just not picking up the phone as a random exercise, just because he could. He was always drawn to that kind of thing arbitrary tests of will, like Gordon Liddy. And I wondered whether he had been working late, as he occasionally did, composing a defense of some slit-eyed felon with an intricately worked out legal, legal argument of his own devising, or whether he was having a quick bite at his favorite coffee shop, or making love to some woman the way he had once made love to me. I could feel myself swelling up, just imagining his long dry fingers, tracing circles around someone else's nipples, imagining the getting ready to fuck firmness of his cock. Nothing has ever meant as much to me, to my wish to be out of my own skin, as the milky white lostness of sex with Howard Rose. It is an experience I've given up for the sake of sanity, but have never lost sight of. In the end, you understand, it was a deliberate decision rather than a real change of heart. I don't think there was any other means of disentangling from this sort of twisted, tortuous passion than to reason your way out of it 
over and over again until something clicks and you realize you have confused the signals once again, mistaken the shadows for the light. Still, I continue to wonder whether I am meant for this normal looking life I strive so hard toward, the husband and child and the kitchen all cleaned up when the day is done. I hung on the phone long enough to hear Sarah calling out in her sleep, but no, I was only imagining it and Richard stirring next to me in the bed, caught up in a dream. After that, I turned off the light on my side, felt a faint kick in my belly, more of a flutter really, and lay listening to the sound of my own breathing in the dark. Wow. So Daphne, before we went online, uh, Catherine and Marianne asked me how long we had known each other. And I had to confess that it's basically forever. It goes back to, back to when I was a very young editor at the New Yorker magazine and you were an even younger <clears throat> editorial assistant. And we've stayed friends ever since. But for almost all that time, one way or another, you have been working on this novel. What took you so long? I noticed one thing that Chip has nicely done. Instead of saying I worked in the New Yorker typing pool, he put it that I was an editorial assistant, which I wasn't. Um, and it is true that I showed Chip, who was one of my very few devoted and acute readers, this novel, which I signed up to do with a house long, a publishing house long since vanished called Poseidon. Um, I shudder to think how long ago, probably definitely at least 30 years ago. Um, I didn't, those were different times in every which way, but including in publishing. So I didn't have any pages. I just said I wanted to write a novel about an obsession, which had always interested me. But I was particularly interested in trying to figure out a way, figure a way out of an obsession, particularly a dark one, in which, in which the woman didn't go nuts or destroy herself in some way. I can't remember if nine and a half weeks had already been published. I'm not sure. No, it hadn't, it, it, that, it made an impact. I remember this made an, an impact on you. I remember you once called me, I don't know if it was about that or about Damage by Josephine Hart. Right. And you said to me, someone's written a probably dumber version of the novel you're trying to write. And I also remember that you said to me, maybe he still sounds it, you said, but the guy sounds like such a jerk. Why is she interested in him? Which may still be a problem, but I already then had this, these, um, the voice coming in and commenting on the narrative, but it was written in the third person. Um, the whole novel, it was not written in flashback. And I got to page 213. I still remember exactly. And my editor at Poseidon liked it. I still couldn't figure out how to end it, how to release the female character from her confinement. Maybe it also, I mean, there were a lot, a lot of things I changed. I think it was never clear why she ever got into it. Um, 
I don't know what she did. I kept thinking when I wrote this, I had decided there are things in it that are not autobiographical, but I think if you write in first person, many discerning and undiscerning readers, I don't know what you think, Chip, do assume it's autobiographical. And I think my voice is very autobiographical, but there are many, many things that are not autobiographical in it. But I did decide, I had worked in book publishing and the publisher I worked for, Billy Bonovich, said to me, people don't put a, enough of the workplace in their novels, which I thought was true. And what did I know? Well, I knew book publishing. So it was important to me to write a lot about the hapless industry that is book publishing. Um, but I stopped dead because, which in retrospect, since I did go on to write many, whatever you want to call them, exposed essays, I come from an observant Orthodox Jewish background. This is what really stopped me. I kept thinking of the women in the balcony, in my parents' synagogue or shul, as it was called, and what they would think. I think I did have a scene where she called across, that's where I stopped. That, that version, she did call across the floor as well. And I stopped dead and I thought, I just can't put this out there. And I pulled it back and gave back the advance. And then over the next 30 years, all of which I played chip with, I would go back, I would try what I thought of as a French version, which you also saw which was very distilled and more abstract and like Annie or Noish. Um, I never let it go, but I couldn't figure out how to do it in a way that worked. But in the meantime, I went on to write a lot of other things. And then finally, but I also had trouble Chip knows with other, I also had a contract to write a book about depression, a memoir about depression after I wrote a piece in the New Yorker about being hospitalized for depression. That took me many years and many book contracts later. But this was a real hurdle. At some point, I just gave it up. But so, I, yeah. So, the, so, two questions. One, is it's interesting, so you talk about all this other, these essays and stuff in this other book you're writing. You're unusual, I think, among contemporary writers in, in kind of toggling back with equal ease between fiction and nonfiction. Most people these days specialize in one or the other, and you insist on doing both. Is that, a, a, is that make life easier for you or harder? maybe more interesting. <laughs> okay. I've always loved and it's interesting and from the start wrote fiction and always loved critical pieces, reviewing essays. Um, and I think exactly how you put it, the toggling interests me. I mean, for a long time, I did stop writing fiction. And, but it never stopped interesting me as an, as an enterprise. So the, the interesting thing to go back to the novel, which took you so long and you hemmed and hawed and didn't know how to do it. So the finished product, as I suggested earlier, has this very unusual structure. And it has, so as I say, it begins, as you read, it begins in the first person, this woman looking back on this transformational relationship she's had and, and ends with her still looking back. Clearly she, this is 
with her forever. At a certain point, as she's narrating it, she actually, she, she then turns herself into the third person and so on. Right. But the most interesting thing of all, and, and I will say now, the thing that I resisted for years was that at a certain point now in the finished book, a new character or a new voice comes on, I'm gonna call the author. And, and these are these numbered sections called digressions, in which case the author, the person who's writing the book, as opposed to the person who's narrating the book or the character in the book, breaks the fourth wall and addresses us, the reader, directly. And it's, sometimes it's to say, well, what do you think? How's this going? Is this the kind of novel you wanna be reading? Can novels really answer our needs anymore? And sometimes just to tell us what's going on in her life. And the, um, as I said, you know, for the longest time I resisted this and I eventually came to think not only did it work, but it was kind of essential. But why, why did, why did you hit on this and why does it work? I still don't know. Well, I'm very relieved you think it works because in large part, I must say because of you, as I said, I certainly did consider taking it out. And I still think in some ways, although I thought the reader who did not find that or found them annoying, truthfully, would skip them and just trail along the story. But as I felt that for a certain kind of reader, which implicitly I meant myself, a certain kind of sophisticated reader, you couldn't simply tell this kind of story. And it was something I thought about a lot well before Me Too, a story of female submission really without some self-consciousness about the whole subject. And even I would say, leaving aside that particular subject, self-consciousness about the whole act of writing, when there are so many diversions, digressions, if you, you know, if you have it, from reading, which we're all aware of, I certainly feel constantly that it's like tugging, you know, in that proverbial way at a mother's skirt saying, please pay attention to me while everyone's busily watching Homeland. And you're saying, you know, I have a story to tell and it should be of interest. Um, I also was influenced, I think, I did find when I was in graduate school, although I eventually abandoned it partly because of theory and the prevalence and dominance of post-structuralism and all that stuff and deconstruction, I think I did like some of that almost Talmudic, Roland Barthes, SZ, the text, the comment on the text. There was a part of me that always found that intriguing, which I think was some of the reason. And then also, I think I felt, I don't mean I thought the book would have been tawdry without it exactly, but I wanted, at that time when I first started it, I mean, I had dedicated my first novel to Diana Trilling, Lionel Trilling's wife. And I wanted a reader who was, you know, intellectual is a little heavy, but who was literary and interested in, and a more, I kept thinking I wanted Diana Trilling and my sister-in-law in New Jersey, both of them, to, sorry to be insulting New Jersey, Chip, both of them to want to read the book and to be intrigued. And maybe- I, 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 think, I think one of the readers you were writing for was actually yourself. You, this was the kind of book that you wanted to read. And I, I also suspect though, 
that these digressions were literally that. They gave you a respite. They gave you a chance to get out of the straitjacket of this, of, of this obsessive relationship, which is, it's only going in one direction and the reader can see it, even if the narrator can't. And this gives you a chance to, to go somewhere else. So but let's pick up on, you just used the word tawdry. I'm, I'm gonna use another word, sexy. This book is very sexually explicit. Uh, not in a not in a porny way, but it just it is it it's sexually it talks about what goes what goes on in, in bed between this woman and this man. The and I'm tempted to say that it's more sexually explicit than most writing that I can think of by women. For the longest time, you know erotic writing or writing about sex is the province of, has been the province of males. So D.H. Lawrence and Mailer and Updike and Roth. And the, and, and when I think of the, the women who are supposedly erotic writers, with the exception maybe of Anais Nin, to think Margaret Yusinar or, you know, uh, Doris Lessing, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of erotic, it's sexy, but it's not explicit. True. And, and so do you think I'm right about this? That this is new for women to be this bold, this upfront, and, and if it's new, why? Well, something interestingly I've been thinking about since the course I just taught, we read, and I was restruck really that women's erotic writing, when you said, there's something filmy about it, not yes, right. We read Margaret Duras, *The Lover*, which never gets particularly. The details are all left out. Um, we read. It's the not sure if it's meant to be a novel or a memoir. I think it was published as a novel that I think I reviewed when you were at the New Yorker. Or I'm not sure. Called *Simple Passion* by Annie Arnaud which is about an affair and the aftermath of the affair. Also remarkably undetailed. Um, and then we did read one novel that has always stayed in my head that I think was essentially not disowned, but disassociated from by Jenny Diskey, the, S, the British essayist who died not long ago. It was her first book and it was called Nothing Natural. And it was about a sadomasochistic relationship. And I reread it and was struck by how graphic it was. That was rare. And I think, I agree with you, Chip. I think when you were talking about men, I of course thought we argued and you were correct about what kind of sex was J James Salter talking about in a sport in a pastime. I don't know why I argued otherwise. Um, I don't know. I think women felt, not sure whether they still feel a certain, you know, that they're supposed to be the more, maybe all of this has been, you know, turned you know, thrown away like old clothes. Well, I don't see much of it. Um, that women are supposed to be, again, maybe no longer the more refined, genteel, um, more erotically profound sex. So why would- Part of, part of it is that, that as you suggested earlier, to write well about sex is really hard. And it's interesting, yeah. it's interesting to me that, that Martin Amos, no stranger to writing about sex in his new book says you can't do it anymore. Right. And the, but, but, but clearly we, we have to be able to, I think. And um, the, and it's interesting to me that that the, the, the certain taboos still exist. I, it's, 
Um, they do. Because I think, don't you think, or I, I, I think the whole subject, certainly outside the realm of porn, where it's meant to be the subject, is it still squeamishness inducing? Is it invading a turf, a territory that's supposed to be, quote, private? How do you disclose this much? Um, having done it once, I don't want to sound grandiose, but having once entered that territory in between stopping the novel, this novel, the first time, I wrote a piece for the New Yorker that Chip knows about. Of course, that has, I would say, haunted me forever. And then I was certainly produced a certain, which was an erotic, which was a piece about erotic spanking, which was called Unlikely Obsession. And at the time, Tina Brown, no, what's the word, shrinking violet, said to me, did I want to consider publishing it under a pseudonym? And I said so too. At which point I thought all that would happen is the pseudonym would be discussed and someone would figure it out. And there was a piece I still, I mean, The only person who thought it was no big deal whatsoever, really, I have to say, was a gay editor at the New Yorker. I leave it. And I think in the gay world, these issues do not have the valence they have in the so-called, one can still say straight world in this day and age, um, or gender normative, or what the ever be right phrases. Um, and I was, I think the New York, then the New York Observer wrote a piece, was I a bad mother? How could you write this kind of piece? I mean, you would think I wrote about butchering and hanging from hooks. I mean, it was sort of uh, fairly not all that far out, but I think a woman writing about these subjects lends herself to pillorying is maybe strong, but a certain amount of derision that men don't come in for. I don't know if you agree. No, I think that's probably right. So, but, but another thing, so you, you use the word obsession. And so that, that, brings, that brings me back to the, the, the title of your book which you call 22 minutes of unconditional love. I think a lot of people would say it's, that's not love. It's 22 minutes of unconditional obsession. It's 22 minutes of unconditional desire. Um, it's 22 minutes of sexual thraldom. And in fact, that the, 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 the narrator comes out at the end and in, in the passage that you read it's quite so movingly she's clearly moved on or you know but but this kind but so this is the also this is the kind of love that you're not supposed to write about right i mean for the longest time i mean yeah. I, you know i mean the the cheesy example is 52 shades of gray but 50 50 it's no accident that 52 shades of gray clearly touched the nerve, right? Absolutely. Because I think this remains sort of, I mean, in terms of calling it unconditional love, I do think in the now in Judith Stone, who is the woman view, that kind of sexual pleasure feels like unconditional love. She's getting, but I think it remains certainly for women. I mean, men are supposed to be the ones for whom sex is the be all and end all. And then women are supposed to enjoy it on the way to procreation or more or housekeeping. <laughs> that, they, that they would stop dead in its 
wait. It's sort of not supposed to be the way it should be, I think. And that is where, I guess, the 52? 50, was it 52 shades? I thought it was 50. I don't know how many, I think 52, but it could be, but then, you know. I read 60 pages of it and then wearied. So do you think that there are still areas that are taboo for fiction that we can't go to that, or, or women can't go to? Do you, is that still that kind of, or, or has we, have we broken through finally? And, and what has the Me Too movement done for all this? Has this empowered women? I kind of think probably it has. It certainly has an, in my opinion, the problem in my, I mean, having written more dubiously, or at least expressed some doubts about Me Too, for me, one problem is that fantasies, whether of men or of women, don't conform or concord with prescriptive identity politics. So I think I could be wrong, but I think for many reasons, um, and not for obviously every woman, the notion of being kind of taken over still remains a female fantasy of being, uh, you know, of succumbing to sort of male dominant passion. I don't mean beaten up and left for dead, but, and that's not given much place. I've never particularly thought, first of all, I don't think there is enough nuance in Me Too theology or whatever you want to call it. I'm not sure the notion of consent has enormous place in sexual life. I don't know how many 23 year old women are enormously drawn to a 24 year old guy saying to them, is it okay with you if I lean over and give you a kiss and my kiss you, in my opinion, they are turned off forever and we'll never see the guy again. I don't think, I mean, I also have nephews and nieces who have told me stories. I don't think whatever the resolution, and I don't think there is an easy resolution to, you know, harassment and force and power imbalance. I'm not sure it's, it's the way out of it. This is a long-winded way of saying, I don't know if Me Too has empowered women to go into areas that were off limits literarily. I'm not sure. Do you, do you clear? You think yes? No, I don't. No, I don't. I don't know either. I think. I think it's the the impulse of me too is is began. It's telling secrets. I'm. I'm going to tell. I'm going to say what I've never been able to say before. Right. So, uh, but a lot of what you're saying, I agree with. I. I. I, I continue to think it's fascinating that as men are shutting up about sex. You know, a couple of years ago, somebody wrote, a, I think it was Naomi Wolf or somebody, sorry, wrote a piece about complaining about Jonathan Franzen and some other people saying they're all wimps compared to Updike and Roth, that they were all, all softies and so on. And there, there may be some truth to that. I mean, the fact that Martin Amos, of all people, would say we can't be writing about sex anymore. It's interesting to me that now there are women who are saying, yeah, no, we can do it. Um, Right, that we can, yeah. But there, I mean, I think one subject that has been written about and sometimes very well is incestual, either pedophilia or incest has been increasingly written about or near incestual relationships. Incest, I mean, yes. Um, but I don't know whether 
I haven't read enough a uh, 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 enough or any fiction that I think goes into very the whole what the French call abjection. That whole area seems I haven't read Gar Garth Greenwell. Yeah. I thought what I read of his fiction that, that was something he goes into a lot. And Alan Hollinghurst does sort of the willingness to sort of abase yourself for the beloved does seem more explored in gay literature, gay male literature. Gay literature, yes, than, than in, in heterosexual. I think that's probably yeah. right. Yeah. You know what? It's now. We've got just a few minutes to go. Does it make sense to ask for questions? Can we do that? Are there questions? Marianne, are you fielding this? Yeah, um, there's one or two comments. Um, I, I do want to um, acknowledge and, and ask you, Daphne, if you want to uh, reflect on the comment by Honor Moore, uh, who writes here, um, Female erotic writing challenges patriarchy. Male erotic writing reinforces it. Your thoughts on that? I thought that was intriguing. Much as I do love honor, for me, this statement is too neat. Um, I don't believe female erotica always, it's too politicized a statement for me about literature, which I don't think has innately, I don't think should have a political agenda. So in that sense, I actually do not agree that all male erotic literature, I forgot what was the word, established. Uh, um, uh, uh, re reinforces, sorry, reinforces it. Yeah, I think it's reductive, may I say, argumentatively. Do we have any more questions? If, if we're not, I have, I have some. Chip, why don't you go right ahead right no. now? So I want to ask Daphne if at 4.30 in the morning she has these gloomy thoughts that I do about the future of a certain kind of high literary culture, the future of this kind of novel. Um, yes. At 4.30 in the morning, being attacked by beetles, um, I think the future for this kind of novel, although as you and I have discussed Chip, there were never a ton of readers for this kind of novel. It always, I remember when I was in book publishing, first in book publishing, I was amazed that the kind of novel I would have raced to review was nearly unpublishable. <laughs> Um, it was usually published as a, not as a favor, but you had to fight for attention. And I think that is more the case because critical attention doesn't matter that much the way it once did. I mean, a very good review or four very good reviews do not make much difference. So, the commercial value and stake have gone up, don't you think? No, Somehow. I, go ahead. Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. Um, but I, I would like to then therefore add a shout out to our hosts tonight. I, I frankly, I think that independent, for okay. the very reasons that you're talking about, independent bookstores make a huge difference. Okay. And the, uh, and, and even forums like this, you know, a few years ago, if you had said to me, you know, would you like to go on Zoom? <laughs> you know, I would, are you kidding? I hate Zoom. 
I hate Zoom, I hate looking at myself. Um, but clearly, and I've done this for, you know, uh, several books in the last few months, it matters. And, and, um, and, and, I, and I, so I, I want to cling to the fact that I think these books do matter and, and that the, the job is to get the news out. Yeah. It's just harder to do that than it used to be. Yeah, much harder. I agree. But I think also maybe one of the mistakes within publishing is, or not mistakes, that's not the right way to put it. These books are never going to compete with the new, I don't even mean the new John Grisham. They're not going to compete with the new, what a friend of mine who published a lot of them calls faux literary. Like, I'm trying to think of who I mean. You shouldn't because it will be a diss. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, we know. No literary, so I won't. Um, but I think it's gotten harder. I mean, Marianne and Catherine, you would know. You carry a lot of good literary, I suppose also faux literary or whatever, but isn't it harder to sell? Well, it, you know, it certainly is, but I, but I have to say, and, and thank you both for, you know, supporting a small independent literary bookshop by, by presenting, you know, this event. Um, it means a lot to us and this is how we continue. Uh, we have continued the specialty really that Canio Pavone himself began literally 40 some years ago uh, when, uh, you know, Sag Harbor really was a literary village of writers, publishers, editors, novelists of, of all sort, but particularly um, among the more sophisticated readers that you're referencing. So I feel that we're in a very um, uh, fortunate uh, position to be able to specialize in that way and, and have a supportive community um, who have readers coming in the door looking, they'll, they'll know they'll find something uh, maybe a little special or different uh, than they might find at another more general shop. So, so we may not even be the best persons to ask this. I don't know if Catherine has another comment about that, but um, this is what we like. So, so there, that's what we're selling. And, and we're continuing. And I would just uh, add that, you know, I have great faith in the young generation because we have a lot of discriminating readers who come to the store and are very interested in literary fiction. So again, we're a small slice of the pie, but the people are out there. And I think literary fiction has always had, been, had a smaller slice of the pie. So it's just continues, um, but have faith and you, know, you, you, you create your work and you put it out there and it, it will find an audience. So um, I, I really do believe that. And we really appreciate what the two of you have brought. I mean, this discourse, is very important to literature going forward. And um, we're very glad that you chose to, you know, join us for an evening and to talk about your, your new book, Daphne, and shift the two of you in relationship uh, on this, brought up a lot of interesting things. I do see there is one other question and comment, which maybe we can get to, and that will be the last. Mm -hmm. uh, ben has put into, the, uh, Dickinson has put into the chat, is it possible that sexual Congress is so particular and mammalian, if you will, that literary renderings of it amount to a kind of embarrassing psychological kibitzing. Literature is always praised when it achieves the universal, but maybe particular sexual encounters are hard to render or describe in any universalizable way. Right. I, for me, that is distinctly and astutely put as part of the problem that in some way the experience we're all mammals as he just said mammalian we're all mammals we do mammal stuff but it's a sort of solipsistic activity it comes very singularly 
do all do the same basic whatever things. But you, does anyone recognize themselves in, well, he's not a good, I was going to say in Lawrence's descriptions? No, but he may not be a good example. But here's the thing, and this is the challenge for writers to go ahead. I mean, this is such a huge part of all our lives, right? And this is what's so, I think, wrong about novelists retreating from it, mm -hmm. pretending that this is not what what motivates so much of what, who we are and what we do and, and so on. And, and to kind of pretend that that's not a huge part of what's going on, it seems to me wrongheaded. Right. I mean, it would be interesting, although not at the moment, to further discuss at some point, and I think Ben has gone, why is it so hard to do? Part of it is that we don't have good language. So it all, it, everything, it becomes, it becomes cliche or porno or. Flowery. Yeah. Yeah. So, and one of the virtues of your book to, to end on this is that it's none of those things. It's simply, it just says, it says what's going on. It just names, it just it details. This is this, this, this. Which my editor flinched at throughout but I ignored her. So I, I even think that the, the ladies in the balcony in the show can't be that offended. Thank you. They never read it, so I don't have to worry. <laughs> well, on that note, <laughs> it is, it is very, very it's very late for Daphne, so maybe we will thank you and, and wrap it up. Um, I, have, I have just dropped in the chat. Uh, listen, it's really challenging for authors now to get their word out because the book out because the pandemic still lingers. So you can purchase it from us directly or through our bookshop.org link, which is in the chat. If you get it from us, we have a book plate for the first several who call us. Um, but thank you both really so much for this insightful conversation, uh, Daphne Merkin and Charles McGrath. We, we, we look forward to more discussion about the subject going forward. So, um, Thank you for having us. Thank you. Daphne, ciao. 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 Thank you. Thanks. Thanks to our audience and our esteemed guest. We're very honored to be with you this evening. And we hope you'll see, we'll see you in Sag Harbor sometime. Thank you so Thank much. You. Grazie. Sleep well. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.